Welcome to Twin Peaks Unwrapped. I'm your host, Ben Durant, and beside me is... Brian Kazaska. Hi, Brian. Hey, Ben. How are you this week? Doing well. Doing, Doing really well? Good. Yeah. I'm still riding high on last week's call-in live Twitter show. That was... It went great. I was so happy. I mean, it was great. I was really nervous because... <laughs> I wanted to do this, but it was it was pretty complicated because you want to have get all these people in, and you're hoping that they don't step on each other, and you know it's it's a it's a crazy thing. Yeah, it worked out well, and a yeah. big thank you to everybody who who joined us on ZenCaster and who watched us on the live Twitter feed. Now we know. I only bring this up. We know we had slight audio reverberation on the live on the, show. The, yeah, I, the, our, our regular uh, weekly show is good. That's already up. Yeah, you guys yeah. can listen. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But that, I mean, yeah. That, I we'll mean, fix that. It was it was pretty. Yeah. You saw our setup. It was pretty complicated because we're taking a feed from one place and we got the other feed from us, yeah. and it, it was complicated. So I think I have an idea of how to improve it if we do another show. Like yeah. That. Well, just letting the audience know yeah. that we we we're well aware of that, and that's something we'll work on for next time. But. I, ben did such a great job. He got it all figured out. And you got you had all our notes. You had the show notes. I, I feel we like the we, notes. Sw- oh, we switched. <laughs> yeah. We switched so, roles. We're a good and team. JC came in and she just she nailed it as always. Yeah, she, she just she just comes in and she just sits down and is like I'm ready to do this show. Yeah, yeah. She carried us <laughs> she the whole time while we worried about us. other things. Yeah, thanks, but, Jed. Yeah, it was such an awesome time, and hopefully we'll do it maybe September. Um, we'll keep everyone posted. So, this is kind of our part two mm. with Chris Rodley. He's the author of Lynch on Lynch. And this is such a great time to, to kind of get the second part because we just had, you know, a uh, Room to Dream book. And you'll see some similarities and some stories that are the same. And it's mm-hmm. interesting to have read that book now, Room to Dream, and to go back to this and say, oh, wow, this is where Lynch was. And mm-hmm. I don't know. I think it's a great, a great time to be able to go back to this book. And this is still one of my favorite books out there. I mean, it's up there now with Room to Dream for the best of Lynch books. Wow. Yeah, Room to Dream is awesome. And uh, Lynch on Lynch, I do own. And um, I bought it at our for my first festival. The Great Southern. The Great Southern. Our, yeah. Both are our first festivals. Right. And uh, that's next in the dock of my book reading. And I had this book when it first came out. I think it was in 98 it came out. But I had the first edition. So when you bought it, I was like, I gotta get, I gotta get this because it's the new edition and they have more uh-huh. more in it. Than, but So I, I got to re- read some of it before this interview and I have to go back in and still read some chapters. And it's a great source of information. You're oh, yeah. always referencing it. Ben, when we do a show, Ben's always, he has his books and that's one of the books I always see you <laughs> yeah, with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's a, it's a, it has a lot of great information and if you ever want to Start your own podcast, you know. I think that's a great resource. It totally is. And so, to, to put this in context, we got Chris Rodley on for the 50th anniversary of the U.S. Uh, airing of The Prisoner TV mm-hmm. show. And so, we will, at, even in this part of the interview, we will occasionally talk about Patrick McGowan, who was the star of The Prisoner. So, if you, if we, if you, if that comes up, we're still kind of talking about The Prisoner. But for the mo- most part, we're talking about Lynch. This part of the interview. Yeah, and if you want to listen to part one. Go, um, it was a couple months ago. It was called The Prisoner. Yep. And if you skip that, because you're like, I don't care about The Prisoner, after listening to this, maybe this will entice you to go back and check that out. Yeah. So without further ado, here's uh, Chris Rodley. Let's talk about Lynch on Lynch. You know, uh, it's been over like 20 years now that uh, ago that you made this book. But, you know, it's still yeah. the best... 
book on understanding Lynch, and maybe it's partly because it's his own words, but I love this book. I probably, you know, when we're doing our podcast, I probably use it almost every week. I, I mm-hmm. flip through pages talking about Lost Highway. Let's get into, let's see what Lynch had to say about that. It's such a great book. Do you see some similarities between Patrick McGoon and David Lynch? They seem to both be kind of private people. They, you know, they want to keep the mystery alive. They don't want to share their, like... Yeah, I mean, it's weird. I think they are, like, um, it's like kind of... Uh, in some respects, are incredibly similar. I think the control, I mean, having absolute control, Patrick had absolute control as a prisoner. He was always firing directors. He was always mm-hmm. rewriting scripts um, um, because it, it just wasn't good enough. It just wasn't good enough. So I think the control, they have to share in common. And it's about perfection. It's about doing it the best you possibly can. If you can't do that, go home. Yeah. Don't, I don't want to talk to you. If you're not the best, go away. If you're not going to, if you, you know, I don't care. I'm not interested. So in that respect, they're really similar. They expect absolutely the best of themselves and everybody else. So I think that's, that's good. And in their privacy, they're very similar. I think there it stops because morally, I mean, if you, if you want to get into morals, I can't think of people who are more different. I mean, Patrick was, you know, a serious Roman Catholic. Yeah. And even if a tortured one, a serious monogamy, a monogamous, you know, even if a failed one, I don't know the detail, don't want to know. Right. But, uh, you know, he, he was married to Joan Drummond his entire life from quite early on. I don't know how many, how many links knocked up now, four. So that would have been, that would be an anathema. Having anything like a Frank Booth character anywhere near anything you do would just, I mean, he would just die. Yeah. He, you know, he, he couldn't, he, he didn't even like to kiss women on, on screen. There's a, there's a scene in one of the episodes where, they shot it sort of from behind the woman's head because he had to be a little bit affectionate. It's actually his daughter with a wig because he, could, he couldn't do it unless it was his sort of daughter, which sounds sort of a bit weird as I say it. But anyway, yeah. um, you know, he wouldn't, he wouldn't screen kiss. He wouldn't, he wouldn't have any, any, anything to do with anything like that. So mostly what David's interested in, he absolutely isn't, he would be horrified by it. Um, and also Patrick's got a message. You know, Patrick's about a kind of, he has got a message. He wants to say things. And Lynch has always been, and I think Lynch has always been really down on that. You know, if you want a message, talk to Western Union, whatever the, yeah. whatever the cliche is. But, you know, I think Patrick has things he wants to say. I don't think, I don't think David proselytizes or, you know, so they, they're really different there. And also, you know, Patrick is like his, is like his work. I mean, if you meet Patrick, it's like meeting number six. It, it, he, that, that is that guy. He's well hard mm. and he's really, you know, he's inflexible and he's uncompromising. Whereas with David, you know, there's a huge gap yeah. between the kind of guy he projects and the work. Now, whether the projection is accurate or not, I think it probably is, actually. But that sort of, you know, golly gosh, down home, fresh face, rather innocent sort of TM type guy uh, and all this horror, you know, there seems to be a big gap between him and his work. And actually, with Patrick, there isn't. He is that guy. And there's no gap. There's no room for maneuver. That's the guy. So mm. um, in some ways they're really similar, and in some ways they're really, really different. Either way, I think I'm attracted to those kind of guys anyway. Yeah. So, a lot of people I've made songs about are, are difficult people. Uh, <laughs> and I, there's something about difficult people. I mean, I made a feature film about Donald Camel, who wrote and directed performance with Nick Rose. And, um, you know, Donald, well, I don't even know where to start with him. I think he put a bullet in his brain when he was 62, just like in the end of performance. And he was a, I knew him quite well, and uh, he was, you know, he was a difficult, a very difficult guy. <laughs> and women, actually, yeah, they're, they're kind of, for someone in my position, you've got to interview someone and make a film about someone and try and sort of rein, rein them in and make some sense of it. That's much more of a challenge. So I'm, I kind of like these guys. And like Patrick McGowan, David Lynch had um, does not really do a lot of interviews. How did you convince no. David to, to agree to do these interviews? Well, again, it's, it's slightly like the McGowan thing is in that I it was easy, um, and that sounds weird, but it, it's twenty you know twenty one years ago now, I think. So I just got I got a fax number from CB two thousand. We're making Lost Highway at the time. I just got a contact for him, and I faxed him and. Um, again, a bit like the McGoon thing, I think why he went for it because I said, I don't want to do a book just about the film, far from it. I want to do a book that looks about the photography and the art. I, you know, I, I'm, I, I'm a painter. I mean, I, you know, my only qualification is as a, fine, a painter. So I'm really into the painting. I'm really into the photography. I love the music and um, the photography, you know, all that stuff. I think that's what convinced me to do, that it was going to be about everything. 
Mm-hmm. But um, basically, I sent him a fax, and I just, and then I, and they said, oh, cool, and I just called him up, and he, I called him up, and he just said, Chris, it'll be a blast. You know, <laughs> and, and it was a blast. And he said, so oh. I got on a plane, um, just on the basis of, it'll be a blast. And you're, so you're, getting, you're able to get interviews with him, but then the next thing is kind of opening him up. Like, he doesn't seem somebody who will speak a lot about his work, so how are you able to get him to talk? I mean, I, I think that's slightly flattering, because I don't think I did, really. I mean, I, 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 not to my standard, anyway. I mean, I kind of, I haven't done the book on David Cronenberg before. David Cronenberg just talks. What you do is you turn the tape recorder on and duck, um, and he will, he will tell you everything. And he'll, he's really clever, and he's a kind of philosopher, really. And uh, so, for someone like me, that's a dream. You don't have to hardly do anything. The guy just tells you everything, yeah. um, and references everything, and you're just in a awe. So, I did the Cronenberg book. I didn't even have questions in it. It's just solid, David. I mean, if if, if uh, Lynch on Lynch is a lot of Lynch, the Cronenberg book is only Cronenberg. I mm. didn't even have questions because I didn't have to. Uh, you know, the, the, because David was so t- difficult in a way, um, I had to do it on a Q&A kind of format because I thought otherwise we're, we're in trouble. So I got into, I mean, I think maybe, I didn't even know how bad it was going to be until, you know, before I went, I had this book by uh, Michel Chillon, who's a French experimental composer. You should check mm. that book out, actually. He's, a, he's part of Music Concrete. He did a book just called David Lynch. It's magic. It's a ma- ma- magical book, isn't it? Mm. So I read that, and on the plane going over to L.A., 10 hours, I settled in, had a few gin and tonics, and I kind of got, I thought, this is, oh, wow, so much stuff. When I got there, of course, David couldn't address any of that. He couldn't talk about any of it, because he can't. So the first few sessions were a bit like, Christ, you know, I can't, I can't follow up on these things that have inspired me by in this other book, so I'm going to have to find another way around it. So if he does open up at all, it's because I had to find a way around it, you know, in a way, and the way around it was to get him via other things. So if I could get him talking about something else, he might say something that would reveal something about the films in, in a lot of cases, by, just by inference, you know. I think I had a, a very high expectation because I love the work, and then it's the guy, and there's such a difference. It's like a, it's a huge gap between the work and the guy. Yeah. So I had to sort of come to terms with that. And, you know, it was like 40 or 50 hours. And over, the, over a period of time, it began to work. He, we both changed notes at that time. So, you know, it was just like at the end of the day, there was just like a mountain of cigarette butts, hundreds of empty cups of coffee. And, um, hmm. and, and that's sort of how we did it. Just, it was quite intense. Yeah. Um, uh, it was hard. It was sort of hard. It was, it was not... It wasn't that easy, actually. <laughs> well, lovely people like David have lovely people around them. And I couldn't have done that book without someone called Gay Pope. And she looked after him at the time. She was his kind of aide to camp. And she was just so, such a beautiful person. And she would, she was really, really helpful. And she kind of did a lot of this intermediary stuff or saying, well, David's going out tomorrow. Do you want to come down and look at his photos? And so, you know, she was very. <laughs> She was so, she died of cancer, I think, a few years, not long after that. She was, she was magic. She was mm-hmm. magic. And actually, you need sort of people like that as well around you. David Cronenberg is someone called Sandra, um, I can't remember, I think someone, oh, God, that's awful. He had, looking after him, and, you know, in, in, those people are very important to you if you're trying to do your project like that. Um, both of those people, Gay and Sandra, were, um, very, very helpful in kind of understanding what your problems are and what you need. <laughs> um, and without them, you're not going to get anywhere. Not really. Yeah. Not really. One of my favorite stories he shares is about, you know, it's related to Twin Peaks, and he's talking about, like, he's leaning up against a car, and it's warm, and little Mike is speaking backwards, and it just hits him that he kind of comes up with the red room, and it just seems about all about feelings that kind of motivates him to do things. Did you, do you think that's true? Do you think that's partly how, how he, he reacts to things, the feelings? Yeah, I think it, it might be that it's a mixture. When he told me about Lost Highway, that it started off because his intercom went one morning and said, Dick Laurent is dead. Mm. I thought that was evidently bullshit. <laughs> I, mean, I, I, I absolutely refuse to believe that. I think it's a good story, and I, you know, but I don't believe that. It's nonsense. But anyway, so I think sometimes things happen, um, it really do happen, and others are kind of um, a way of def- a slight deflection, I think. I mean, obviously things do happen. I mean, I think 
you know, in, in, in uh, Mulholland Drive, that whole sequence in Twinkies, that is just inspired by a piece of local uh, folklore, like, you know, one of the one of those diners, or, or maybe it's one of the basic Denny, maybe it was even the Denny, I can't have quite remember, was kind of haunted, you know. So mm. I think he does kind of um, pick, you know, it's, it's like he describes on the radio, you just kind of tune in, and you, you scan around, you pick up stuff that's in the ether, and then you, the trick is making that all make sense in one story. But it's just little things that you're interested in. He never said at the time of Lost Highway, he never said to me anyway, that it was in any way inspired by... I think he didn't say that because that would make it too kind of literal and a bit boring and a bit current affairs -y. But years later he said that. Like, you know, oh, well, actually, I think, you know, they do something. But he didn't say that at the time. But I think because he knows, you know, that's probably not that smart. You know, it doesn't make it sound very mysterious. Yeah. But like, obviously it did. He did mention O.J. Simpson to me, but only in the sense of... Is, doesn't life seem surreal sometimes when you get up in the morning and some guy's evidently killed, his wife is set free. Right. Um, he doesn't want to talk about it any more than that. If he said, well, isn't that a payback for the Rodney King? You know, he doesn't want to get into day-to-day -to -day politics of L.A. and why his sense of might have gotten off. But uh, I think he does this kind of, um, he does pick up on things, other things he doesn't say at the time, and then he says them later on. I mean, something had a bit, I mean, it, it's just, when we did the book, uh, the agreement was that he would get to look at the text. So I, I sent him the galleys, um, and we had a sort of in the middle of the night conversation. And when he called out, and I said, well, what do you think? Um, he just went, Lynch on Lynch, Chris, we should call this horseshit on horseshit. Oh, no. and, um, <laughs> he, uh, I said, what? You know, what? Uh, luckily, he was talking about his own contribution, not mine. Oh. Um, but he cut 14 pages. Now, that's not a lot in a book that size, but the 40, almost almost exclusively, those 14 pages were to do with transcendental meditation and kind of Eastern philosophy and, um, and all that kind of stuff. That's interesting, you know, that he, he didn't want any of that. He talked about it a lot. Didn't, and what happened, you know, not a few years later, that's all he's talking about. Hmm. Um, you know, all he's uh, damn well talking about. It could be anything he talks about with any, in any articulate kind of way. So, weirdly, I'm thinking, well, some things he holds back the flow of information. So, that was always there. He didn't want anyone to know it, or wasn't, you know, certainly didn't want to know it. That was not a priority in that in 1997. And then a few years later, he set up foundations and trying to get, you know, money to have TM taught in school. So, there was a, he must have said there was a time to talk about that. So, I think some things, you 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 hear about something you hear about much later, and that's okay. That's just slow release of information, I think. So some of those things I think really do happen. I mean, there is a sense in which he does try and keep everything on a kind of child childlike wonderment mm. level, you know. And I think there's a, I think it made the update in the book. I think it's when we were talking about weirdly, it might be straight story. I'm not sure. Anyway, there's a something somewhere in the book. I haven't reread really it where he talks about. Masturbating for the first, or not, I don't know if it was the first time, but, but I don't remember this part. Cold, but Maybe it's a rewind. This the park, you know, this white stuff will come out the end and blah, blah, blah. Anyway, he talk, and he talks about it on that level, like a kind of. Wow. It's a kind of wonderment thing, like, whoa, what's that coming out the end? Oh, <laughs> uh, just, what, like, just like what that guy told me about. Uh -huh. Hey, man, that's amazing. And I feel really good, too. It's a kind of, um, you know, wonderment thing, which. It's just a way of looking at it, reframing it, so you look at it for what it sort of might look like instead of if you're involved in it. Yeah. Wow. Um, and it's not untrue, it's all true, all that, you know. And that kind of slightly links to the way somebody talk about, you know, is he a naive, you know, is he like um, the Peter Sellers character in Being There, like Chance the Gardener, he says something and it's either you can't tell whether it's really dumb or whether it's really smart. It could be one or the other, and we're undecided. Um, and that's the kind of you know, because he, he has a very difficult relationship with language and mistrusts language. And he had a problem with words, literally. I mean, he had a, you know, people talk about him having his wife. That's why Peggy talks about him having a kind of almost like a pre-verbal stage in his life. And he seems to struggle with words. So you have to choose him very carefully. And he does. Um, yeah. And I think that's, that's a, that kind of wonderment thing, you know, it's just like uh, if you could look at it how it was when it first happened. 
I mean, I remember the first time I masturbated and something came out and I, you know, I was just, I was just a Woody Allen all the time. I can't, I don't know why. It sounds weird. But, you know, those, those kind of, how you get very used to some experiences and you don't, it's hard to kind of refresh them. And he's quite good at that, I think, refreshing those, yeah. some basic stuff. So, you know, you did a panel on uh, mapping the Lost Highway, and you, you started yes. off questioning if David Lynch knows what he's doing when, when he creates a film. Can you elaborate about that? Well, I think, um, it sounds a bit unkind, isn't it? I didn't understand that. But, um, <laughs> I think it's just that sometimes, I mean, he's brave enough. I mean, you know, it's quite well documented. He's brave enough to, to I mean, to say, I don't know what this means now. Don't bother me now. It will become, yeah. the meaning will become clear later. He said it about a razor head, but after he didn't know what half that stuff meant to him as he was doing it. Um, but he read, then he later read the Bible. I don't believe this either. But anyway, he read the Bible and there was a line there and he thought, that's a razor head. He didn't say what the line was, of course. But I think he got, a lot of time, he's not sure. So if Frank Silver... The, um, the image is reflected in a mirror when you're doing a shot from ten pieces. Don't do it again because it's a fuck up. Mm. You think, well, that, that, that something's telling me something, but I don't know what it's telling me now. It doesn't matter. Let's keep the shot, and then, by the way, in a little spare moment, let's go upstairs, get Frank to crouch by the bed, and we'll just do a pan around the room. You know, it's that kind of. So I think sometimes you don't know, and that's, I think that's fantastic. He's got the brave view. He doesn't. It's not all written down. I mean, it is written down, but he doesn't really know what it all means. So he has enough of a grasp of everything to kind of know that... Well, he doesn't believe in accidents anyway, so if in your world, whatever that world that might be, you don't think there is a a such a thing as an accident, then it's all telling you something. Yeah. Uh, That's, that's, you know, a Mulholland drive is absolutely... You know, if you do the first... If you do a pilot for a TV series, which some dick at HCBS sees early one morning on a VHS and says it's boring, let's not do let's not proceed with this. Um, and then you've got to make that make sense of then a movie. But unfortunately you've planted lots of things. You don't know what you don't know what they are when you're doing. You're planting it, thinking, well, I'll, we'll do that now because down the line we'll find out what that means. Um, and he pla- he sort of plant- planted lots of things in that first um, episode that was meant to be an episode of Mulholland and Drive, and then suddenly it's not going to happen. So you've got to make it all take account of itself. Genius, actually. It is. It is genius. It is something mm-hmm. else. It's totally uh, complex, and I think I don't know how you do that. Um, I'm go- I don't want to take up two yen actually. I'm, he's really convinced me. It's the way. I'm just going to get my mantra. I'm going to sit and look at blank walls and come up with some really good films. I mean, it works. He's, he's a fantastic ambassador for it. Yeah. And I'm sold now. I'm, I'm, I'm giving up being resistant. I'm just going to do it. <laughs> That's awesome. It seems like Lynch is all about is very much about dreams, and but I, I kind of think about your documentary in my mind, and McGowan's daughter talking about Port Marion, and how that actual place uh, where the village was filmed was actually like um, it almost was like a surreal place where it, it could be anywhere in the world, yeah. and she says Neverland, and it's funny because David Lynch, uh, in, in the documentary Blu-ray, he he talks about a place being Neverland, and it's like this almost to me like a dream or surreal place. What? Why do you think McGowan and Lynch are so interested in this kind of surreal locations? Uh, yeah, I, I think maybe if what you're really interested in isn't a kind of real, realist narrative, if, you're, if that's about as far away from what you're interested in as you can imagine, if you're interested in kind of dream space, if you're interested in allegory, if you're interested in human st- struggles, mental and mind struggles, you, mm. you've got to choose very carefully where that takes place. I mean... Mm. If you're not Scorsese and all you care about is people taking drugs on the mean streets of New York, fine. Anyway, you're, you, then it linked to, and McGowan would be interested in the mean streets of New York. Because what's that? That's just a bunch of hookers and drug takers and violent. You know, it doesn't, so I think what they need for what they're interested in, which is not that kind of realist or realistic so-called cinema, they need, a, they need special places. So, I mean, I do think they actually put their own... There's nothing like Port Marion in any way. I mean, I, I wish that North Bend and Snoqualmie were as interesting as Port Marion. They're not, but it doesn't matter. But, but you know, Port Marion was a was the gift to that series. It's impossible to imagine that series without it, mm. uh, and it's impossible to imagine Port Marion without the prison. It's a weird thing. But interestingly, there it is about dreams because actually that was a dream. The whole place is a dream. Coffee in Dallas. It was his dream. It was literally a dream place. It was his dream to create something like Portofino in, in, uh, in, in northern Italy on the coast there. 
something to to make something like that to be something like that. So it was it literally was a dream place. Mm. So he got because he was a they were very well off his family and actually owned that peninsula. I think. So he began, you know, just building it. I mean, it took fifty years. I think he started in 1925. He didn't finish it until after the prisoner was long gone. It took 75. I don't know. So in the 50 years he built it, and it was like a dream. He built his dream. So. In effect, that is literally a kind of dream place. It's kind of interesting, and that there's no, there's not really anywhere like that. Like a, and I think, you know, when you, well, by the time you get to kind of to Twin Peaks, it's, it's easier in America because to most of us, America's like a kind of dream anyway. I mean, you know, America. I love the, all the, all those American songs that are completely and utterly um, built around place. I mean, you think of like 24 Hours in Tulsa. No one knows what you know. No one, no one here knew what Tulsa looked like. Anyway, mm. 24 hours from Tulsa could be anywhere in the world on a plane. But anyway, you know, like 24 hours from Tulsa and Galveston and by the time I get to Phoenix and Wichita Lyman and all this stuff. It's all about place, you know, it's such a lovely thing yeah. about American culture, which is obsessed, especially in this popular music, with place. Last time to Clarksville, I mean, I'm, I mean, I've done a little bit of research in this year. I can't tell you how many clerks there are in America. There are loads. <laughs> um, so I don't know which one. So that's the biggest clerk still doesn't even have a train station. So I'm starting to get already, I'm kind of thinking, dreaming this place, you know. So the last train to clerks that one does, actually it did have a train station, and it was, it was closed at the end of the Second World War. So maybe Neil Diamond was writing a song, the last train to clerks there might have been a, Soldier coming home from the war. I don't know. It's interesting. So there's a kind of whole mm. thing about place, and I think Lynch and, and McGurn need those kind of abstract places, yeah. um, which by all these diners, every diner, you know, looks like those diners. Right? And I've been in a lot in America. I love American diners, yeah. um, and I expect them to be exactly like that, and they are like that. Mm. <laughs> They're brilliant. So it's a kind of. Um, I think in the prisoner's case, it was a dream place, literally. Um, and I think in Lynch's case, it's just archetypal America. It's that kind of, um, you know, it, you can't go wrong, actually. You can't go wrong. In China, if you just want to be driving around in a taxi in New York, I mean, that's not very interesting. But So, uh, you know, when he moved outside of Twin Peaks in the last year, in the new series, it was interesting because everywhere became slightly... I mean, t- the town of Twin Peaks is a dream. Right? Yeah. It's not right. real, is it? I mean... From the very first episode, I think when Bobby was my favorite right. character, <laughs> when Bobby was just back, backing out of the restaurant doing that book, uh, <laughs> train walk that he does, going, I'll see you in my dreams, Norma. That's true. Um, and all... when she says, I'll see you first. And then they were all these, you know, everyone talked about dreaming in that place. It's true. They talk, they, they talk about it a lot. Alone. And, and sometimes they say we live dreams. inside a dream. We live inside a dream. So yeah, I mean, they're being. Oh my God, it's gotten even more now. I mean, the dream, a dream, a dream, and then it's stuck in the dream. You know, yeah, it's gotten even more dreamy. Both uh, Patrick McGowan and Lynch seem to be more interested in exploring the character's inner conflicts rather than the external conflicts. And I think about sure. Lynch on Lynch, you know, uh, David talks about that, you know, why was Cooper possessed by Bob? And he kind of says he was really up against himself. Yes. And I think, I think I mean, it's weird, isn't it? It's weird. It's weird that um, 50 years ago, our, our most you know revered TV guy made of the most expensive television series ever made uh, at that time, and it turned out that it was about him having a bad fight. It was a one guy, and half of them was bad, and half of them was good. And then, you know, years later, 20 years later, we're kind of in the same place in Twin Peaks. This weird thing about Good and bad. I mean, I think they are they are a bit different. It's interesting they both, however different they might be, they both ended up kind of in the same place. Yes. They, up, but they both they? passed through the same point, which is it's only about you. It's about your um your your you know conflicted person. You're a half and half person. You've got bad and good. I mean, I think what may be different is in Patrick's hands. It's just an al- It's not just an al- It's an, al- an allegory. So it's, mm. kind of, it's a way of representing an idea. Whereas with David, I think it's not. Analogy. I think it's what he thinks life is like. I think that is life. You know, life has lived on many different levels and it's in many different planes. And um, it makes sense that, you know, these opposites would exist. 
Um, so I think with David it's more about actually a kind of belief about how about human existence. Whereas I think with Patrick it's just a way of making a point. If I could if I could get rid of my bad self, I could do a lot of good. The problem is I sort of quite like my bad self. Here. Right. And uh, so if you've ever hung out in pubs in Ireland, I haven't done a lot of it, but the little I've done. It's all about that, you know. You can go in there into a pub in Ireland, and within two minutes, after a couple of Guinnesses, you know, um, you're talking, you're in, in serious, serious discussion with total strangers about really quite heavy stuff. Yeah. And if you go in there two nights in a row, you're a regular, and you're really up to it. And you're really, it, it, it's all, it's all about this, you know, the struggle. It's very packed, actually. Hmm. It's, the point is not to get there. You don't, the point is not to arrive. That's boring. The point, the good thing is the struggle. It's the struggle, yeah. not not the getting there. And uh, you know, and, and, I mean, I think it's you know, any Irish artist who's successful knows that as soon as you become successful, they just cut you off. Because mm. <laughs> what the point? You know, what do you, what do you, you know, I think when Neil Jordan became a successful film director, the Irish people abandoned him. This, what's he, 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 you know, what's he doing? Yeah. He's successful. He's going to Hollywood. Um, Wrong. No. They don't like that. I think the point is the struggle, not the arriving. That's that's typical factor. He never arrived. He was just struggling all the time. I gather from Catherine he he did find some <laughs> what he can have peace to at the end of his life. Okay. Um, I would have liked to have seen that. I didn't see any sign of it in uh, nineteen eighty three. Not a single sign of it. Oh, that's too bad. It really is too bad. Everything was up I think everything was mad. I mean it, it's not that revealing, but it, it, sometimes when you're not in, you know, you're dri- we were dri- driving around, uh, we had a soft top car. Oh no, we just had an only car, but anyway, we were driving along um, Santa Monica, somewhere along Santa Monica. And because I'm a, you know, a star fucker, you know, it's my first time in America, and I kept seeing all these interesting, all these famous names. And anyway, I was coming along the other way in a, in a soft top car was Lee Marvin. And... Um, I just was going, oh, look, it's Lee Marvin, it's Lee Marvin, like an idiot. And um, hmm. he just pulled, I and mean, Patrick just screamed to a halt, that she stormed out of the car and went into the bar. And uh, I went and followed him, and I sat, you know, he was so angry about something. And um, I didn't like to ask, and he just said, he's got a glass jaw, that Marvin, he's got a glass jaw. And uh, I said, I didn't know what was going on. Well, apparently he'd been, you know, and his wife, Joan, had been to a party, and Mar- Lee Marvin had come up to his wife and said, he couldn't even say the word, how would you like a good, fuck? he couldn't say fuck, he had to mouth it. Mm. How would you like a good fuck? And um, apparently McGoon um, hit him, knocked him to the floor, broke his jaw. And um, he went to see Lee Marvin the next day in the hospital, he's telling me. Wow. And he st- stormed, stormed in and said, Mr. Marvin, when you come out of the hospital, I'm going to kill you. Oh, my gosh. Um, I, I won't kill you if you send a dozen roses to my wife for every word you said. How would you like a good fuck? I make that seven dozen roses. And, um, you know, so Joan got the seven dozen roses and he didn't kill Lee Marvin. But that kind of um, uh, really <laughs> extreme moral compass uh, don't ever do that right. I will kill you and I believe it I believe it yeah. and I, I thought I was rather Christian that Lee Marvin who's a marine as you probably know could get knocked down to <laughs> by our, our patch our very own patch of the when Lynch on Lynch, uh, Lynch also let you uh, interview some of his friends for the book. Did talking to yeah, the... I mean I, that was very good. That was a risk. I wouldn't, let, I wouldn't if I were in his position. I wouldn't. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, he. Um, I just said well, I'd like to speak to Peggy, your first wife, and I told him all the people I want to talk to, and uh, the lovely day Pope gave me the numbers. So although I met few of them because I, I would be a favor and favor didn't want to pay much for the book anyway. Anyone who was in 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 LA, I met. And the other guy spoke to at length on the phone. And he was very um, open about that. And that, that was, some of that was rather disturbing. I mean, I think speaking to Isabella Rossellini, who's, uh, I can't I don't know if I put this in the book, actually. But she basically, I mean, you're dealing with someone, this is 20 years ago, who just said, I can't believe he didn't love me anymore. Uh. I mean, one day he just said, didn't love me anymore. And you could tell us, because this is the great Isabella Rossellini. Yeah. How dare he, for a star, tell me. He didn't love me anymore, and wow. she's really hurt. And how she couldn't go and see, she wasn't couldn't see movies anymore. Although I noticed she's been doing some 
talked last night to you at the Festival of Destruction, I think. Yeah, we saw her there. Yeah. 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 So, but at that time, I spoke to you, it's like, how could he do that to me? Right. And I'm thinking, right, yeah, I would you. Or, um, you wow. know, Peggy, the first wife, who I love the, the most, talked to you. She was, you know, she was, that's someone who obviously, you know, went, had some, you know, went through a lot of difficult times with him. Um, she was lovely. And Stuart Cornfield, you know, to, I knew Stuart Cornfield a bit, and he was, um, he produced Elephant Man and produced The Fly with David Crane, and was an absolute, you know, gent. Um, but he was very, uh, I learned quite a lot, just mostly from the women, actually, I think. I don't really know in a weird way, but that, you know, lots of people will have to, in the past taken issue with this kind of view of women and sexual politics, but I don't really care about that. But I think some of the, you know, it's probably quite difficult having a, a relationship with someone who's like that, who's kind of yeah. doing the work, you know, it's really the work, always, which is what's so brilliant. When I went to the, the, Cartier, the Cartier Foundation exhibition a few years ago, you know, it was good snacking. And I couldn't believe that he'd once said to me, well, I didn't want, I didn't tell people about my painting because I didn't want to be regarded as a celebrity painter. Well, that's about as far away as from celebrity painting as I can imagine. I mean, yeah. I was in the hotel in Toronto and saw Antonio Curtis was there and there was an exhibition of Tony Curtis' watercolors of flowers. I mean, that's celebrity painting. Yeah. Like, shocking. Um, you know, someone who just never stops. I mean, if you saw that show, just the volume of it. Everything, doodles, uh, unbelievable stuff. It was just like someone who just was manufacturing this stuff constantly. Isn't that something? Um, mm. Constantly, on every level, frightening, brilliant. Yeah. God, I mean, it just makes you feel lazy. It makes anyone feel lazy looking at that show. What do I do with most of my life? You know, not much, as it turns out. <laughs> uh, <laughs> what do you What do you think Lynch thought of your book, the finished? Book? Um, I think he. I I can assume he liked it because every time, you know, it's not the least. I can't think he's ever said anything particularly, but because every time they do a reissue of a, do, you know, remastering a DVD and he gets involved with the Criterion Collection, they, I always get the call. Can we can we reproduce the chapter, the relevant chapter in the book to go along with that DVD Blu-ray reissue? So I, I assume he kind of likes it. Yeah. <laughs> I think he's embarrassed by his own comments. I think hmm. he's embarrassed by his own comments. He doesn't like to read. Um, I don't think he likes to read himself. Yeah. Um, it's funny. I made a note. I made a note about uh, the excerpts from the the Blu-rays and the DVDs, and I and I, I was so happy every time I get one of those uh, Blu-rays and I open it up and there's excerpts from your book. It's like, oh, this is wonderful. And I already have your book, but I still think it's great that you, there's there's some in there for pe for new people who are maybe just finding out about your book. They get a little sample of it. I mean, I think, you know, I'd love to do an update, but uh, that would be kind of difficult now because he's sort of, you know, because when I saw Inland Empire and I saw all those people in the hotel in Woods sort of waving and, and singing to Nina Simone, I thought, well, he, this is a part, he's, he's going, isn't he? This is how everyone get as many people together as we can, and we wave goodbye. Mm. Um, and uh, I think after that, there's just been this massive, massive work, though, but it's just not easy, you know, there's so much to look at, and it will be like little fractured pieces like stuff little uh, but we really should do um an update but you know i think in publishing now it's quite difficult the, the, the publisher of the publisher of the original book kai the cinema they wanted to do the first lot of updates not favor and favor and then i think they've all been brought up by bigger people and uh, so no one's really that i know is particularly interested in updating it and, and actually they were a lot of work and it's not about it's not cinema so it's kind of interesting I mean, I would take issue with them. You know, there's this kind of thing about, I think there's um, Tim saying about how the art house circus is dead and mm. cable is the new thing. Well, I have to, you know, I suppose that's one reason why, one reason why you might want to do that. I'd have to really take serious issue with that. I mean, it is dead, but it, but the cable circuit is not by any means a replacement. I think that, you know, that pro the problem, for, it isn't a problem, but one aspect of the return is that you know, if everything really becomes, it's, it's, it's a bit like a dream. In a cliche way, there's no substitute for a dream experience and the surrealist in it than to go into a cinema and sit in the dark and the lights go down there with a bunch of people and um, when the lights come up, you wake up and go out in the street. <laughs> That's the kind of dream. Watching something, even if you've got a 4K fuck-off television yeah. at home, it's not the same. It's true. And... 
you know, I, I, I'd like to see the return in a cinema, in a four, you know, 18 hours. I just show the whole damn thing. <laughs> I'll take sandwiches and I'll sit there and I'll sink into it. And, and, and you know, the cable is not the answer yep. for Dream. I think it's completely wrong about that. It's not bad, and that's the only way he's going to get his money. But it ain't no substitute right. for a bunch of us going to, you know, I saw that husband was building on his arm plus 15 hours in the cinema. It never, I tried to watch it a few years ago again on DVD, it just didn't work, you know. That's I, true. I, I don't think that was so good. Yeah. Probably because I was sitting in the cinema in New York. Fifteen hours. So Brian and I job. went to New Brian and I went to New York uh, MoMA, and they were showing a weekend of all eighteen parts, and yeah. uh, I got to see eight eight of the parts of eight eight, eight of the eighteen or is so that four four of it. But it is such an amazing and they and they redid the coloring and they redid the for, for the big yeah. screen, and it yeah. was a beautiful picture. And I I wish I could have done the whole weekend, but eight hours <laughs> was too, enough for me. I mean, to, really, <laughs> like just going to get into that kind of Bollywood frame of mind. Yeah, take. Take some food, take some family. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> you need to camp there. out, get a cot. Yeah. Camp out. Fantastic. <laughs> get, a, I, you know, get a catheter fix. You can just sit there and piss yourself. Don't even worry. Yeah. Um, be fantastic. You don't have to move. That would be good. That would be that something. Would be good. I, think, yeah, I think I have to tell him about this. It's not going to work, his idea about cable. It doesn't work. Yeah, I know. And that's, um, that's, a, that's a climb down, I think. Right. I know from the first years, you know, obviously the first years on 525 lines, NTSC, appalling huh. and i guess he's now falling in love with, with digital but um yeah it might be a temporary love affair like like his affairs <laughs> he might come down again yeah maybe maybe and so you know, Patrick McGoon was very involved when you when you originally did, did did the interviews with him. He was like, "Oh, you know, the camera should be here. We're going to walk here. We're going to do this." And he yeah, kind of was controlling exactly. things. When it came to David Lynch, just to interview him, was he direct you, or did he say we should spend more time on this, or was it really up to you to kind of shape where where the the interviews yeah, went? Yeah, no, he didn't. He absolutely didn't try. And I mean, Patrick is this crazy you know, and was clear from the new film. He, he absolutely tried to. Uh, define how everything would happen. You know, David was very, it was incredibly relaxed. He would just turn up, you know, he'd smoke a lot of cigarettes, drink a lot of coffee. Could never get enough from him. He never says, oh, oh can we talk about this? He just lets you do it. Hmm. Um, I think he's hoping that any minute it's going to stop. <laughs> and you can just get back to, you know, it's going to be over and you're still asking him dumb questions. Um, so he never suggests anything. He never tried to prove his phone out. I think mostly you feel you haven't got enough out of him about any of it. But you have to kind of read the signs and you can see the kind of like, oh, this is really, he's closing this down, mm. so we have to move on. You know, I can tell this is the end of the road on this one. But like all these things, you know, I mean, this is, it was 20 years ago when we spent all our time together. I think I could do a better job now. I mean, I'm, you know, I mean, I did send him, I had to do, um, I had to do this Freud Lynch weekend, last weekend, a whole weekend about talking about uh, Sigmund Freud and David Lynch. And I, he asked me to interview him on stage for the, for the, uh, couple okay. of, and disruption, and I yeah. couldn't. So I said, well, just swap. I've got six questions I want to ask you that I could like to, to or do at the Freud Festival, and uh, nothing. I mean, really nothing. Um, he just didn't want to... I probably shot myself in the foot, because the first question was, what year is this? And then he <laughs> might have thought, you know, you know what That's a smart true. ass. Um, <laughs> or who... I thought you might tell me, or, you know, is the person answering this question the good David Lynch or the bad one. It was that kind of that kind of stuff. Yeah. To indicate that we could have some fun with it, we didn't have to be a serious. Right. And if, whichever, whichever one it is, what's the other one up to? But he, you know, he, he um, right now. But um, I think, uh, <laughs> no, no go there. Oh, that's too bad. Basically, you know, if you're ever doing those weekends, you're, in, you're usually surrounded by a lot of very clever people who have studied psychoanalysis and studied Freud and studied this and studied that, and they write papers really clever and then they get up on stage and they read those papers Aww. they don't look at the audience they, they have a lecture and they have a little light and they read those papers and, and for you know? the Lynch uh, Freud conference how was it for you I mean what did you talk about at well, that well it was it was weird for me because I wasn't going to write a paper I'm not an academic I'm not going to write a paper and get up there and just read the paper and expect people to kind of applaud me and think that's good I mean I, I, I had some basic bullet points uh, 
And I was more concerned about in, engaging with the audience and you know, having, you know, giving a performance, not reading a paper. Right. So I was I was just an aberrant one. He sort of got up there and because I know him a bit, but only a bit, could talk about him and about you know. But so I was a sort of um, anomaly. Really. Hmm. Although I was slightly flattered <laughs> that after some very heavy. Italian psychoanalyst who knew Bernardo Bertolucci very well uh-huh. um, down with me and I'm um, just talking you know, about all this and that um, and then said I must try that you know more not just delivering papers and I thought yeah why not why didn't you try that you know you could look at your you know I thought you you guys were clever <laughs> you remember the theories right so somebody read out something about the lost highway oh man I mean, she didn't even look up. Yeah. Oh. She had lots of slides, and everyone applauded, and I thought, oh, I don't know, I, don't, I wouldn't sort of do it for me, right. particularly. <laughs> and I think David, I wouldn't do it for David either. I mean, you know, I mean, he's sort of right that you don't, you can't want to film as this, it's quite difficult to put it back into words. I mean, that's, you know, it, it exists as words at some point, that's good. But to then take it back and make a word equivalent of that movie after the, you know, the gorgeousness of the movie is quite difficult. I don't think he's sort of, I don't think he's interested, I don't blame him. It doesn't, it's not so good. Yeah. Um, it, I, I think, you know, I mean, it's, all, it's, not, it's always, always annoying if you've my, done my job as long as I've done it, when an artist said the world speaks for itself, but in fact, I think he's, you know, he has a huge trust in his audience. He mm. absolutely has faith in them. And he knows that they really know what it means, and they just have to have confidence. They just have to have the confidence. Think, I'm, you know, I, I think it means this. Yeah. And the, the only way you can find out how clever you are, rather than you know, how clever a lecturer is, is by talking about it with other people. And then when they say something you don't agree with, you go, no, no, that's not what it's about. It's, <laughs> you're wrong. This. And then it comes out in discussion, and why should he say what he thinks it is? I mean, yes. if he says it means this to me, that's all it means. And everyone says, well, that's what it means. And then the conversation stops. So I think... It's true. You know, it's important that he keeps out of the conversation. Yeah. It doesn't matter what it means, what it is for him. It, that's just what it is for him. Right. It makes sense. The only thing it is. So I think I'm totally in sympathy with him, actually. He's convinced me that after saying the work speaks for itself is valid. Pain is an interview, but anyway. You got to be on the set of Lost Highway. What was that experience like, especially watching a Lynch direct? Yeah, he, you know, it's funny. I just recently looked at something on... on I just discovered something just surfing um, of him getting really angry on set and swearing. <laughs> I can't remember what it was in connection with going, who fucking cares about how long a fucking scene is? It's fucking driving me nuts. I mean, really angry and aggressive. I never saw him like that. I yeah. was on the Lost Highway set. I was on the... Maybe it's become more grumpy. I don't know. But, the, you know, I, we were... It was the 13th week of the shoot. It was the graveyard shift. It was five in the evening to five in the morning. The worst. Everybody was happy. Everybody was having a really good time. He knew everyone's name. He's complimenting everybody on their work. Mm. I mean, this guy, I think he's called Gary Demeter. He's used um, some special effects, uh, in-camera effects. And Gary just crossed in the... Um, then he's just sitting there, and I just, I just, I just, I just Gary, so that's the name <laughs> Gary. And um, Gary had obviously helped him mount some heavyweight speakers in his house. And he just went, Gary, those speakers aren't going anywhere, man. <laughs> just kind of double thumbs up, and Gary's happy, and everyone's laughing. Um, that was my experience of him on the set. Yeah. Um, someone who will, is, is she knows everybody's name, is lovely. I mean, Balthazar Jeffy came along with a kind of mixtape for him, and then she held up a shot so he could go and listen to the tape. And uh-huh. got himself there, he's going, I've got to shoot the fucking scene, David. He's like, and I'm just, I won't be long, I'm just, Balthazar bought me this tape. So that's, and then you'd see him whisper a little thing to an actor, something very small. So I, I, he would be my model, you know, for how to direct, which is uh, make sure you know one's name, be really happy. Mm. <laughs> Um, everyone, you know, it was it was an exemplary. I've seen bad sets, and um, and I've seen that and directors not really do much. But to be totally in control, but be very, very, very. God, I don't know. It's a trick. It's a trick. Or maybe it is a trick. Maybe it's just how it is. But it's my idea of what a film shoot should be like. No, awesome. no, no, no sillinesses. 
all those old ideas about directors wearing jodhpurs and carrying riding crops and shouting at people and right. intimidating actors, you know, horrible kind of behavior, totally unnecessary. So yeah. he's my guy in that respect. That's <laughs> awesome. That's so good. Wow. And so what's next, yeah. for, what's next for you? I mean, do you have any new documentaries you're working on? Um, I, I've loads of them. I've got loads of them all the time. I, I think the problem is my, increasingly my taste. It doesn't really square the telly. Huh. So anything I want to do, they go, you must be fucking joking. <laughs> um, so it's, uh, but there are a number of things. Uh, I'm on a, you know, I've got quite charming with this musician, Jean-Michel Jarre, and uh, it looked like we were going to be making a film together, and then the money fell through. It's that kind of thing. Yeah. So I don't know what's going to happen next. I think it's not going to be something I'm, I've proposed. It's probably going to be something someone's going to come to me and say, do you want to do this? And then I'm going to have to think, well, do I want to do it? I think my treasured projects are things that will remain unmade. Huh. Uh, as long as I haven't won the National Lottery, which I did tonight, and I might have won. If I'd won it tonight, then I know what the first one's going to be. Yeah. <laughs> I probably haven't won it. It's a problem. Well, excited, whatever you do. It'll be yeah. interesting to see what, what you do next. And uh, I thank you so much for your time. I mean, it's been really interesting to learn more about The Prisoner. <laughs> it's been more about hearing about the, the book, Lynch on Lynch. And thank you so much, Chris, for your time. Pleasure. Great, great pleasure. Take care. Thank you, Chris Rodley. It was so great to have you on the show. I, it, it's such a wonderful man, and I, I love the stories that he shares. And there were things I was, like, really nervous about. I was like, what? You're going to talk about uh, Rosalini like that? That she was, like, devastated by that Lynch kind of broke up? But we learn in Room to Dream that, that that really is the story. And it's, it's I guess it's well known that this happened, that he mm. just kind of, like, I'm done with you now, and I'm moving on. And it seems so harsh. I mean, we don't live their lives and stuff, but it, just mm. hearing the story from Chris Rodley first, I thought, like, boy, this sounds horrible and it puts lynch in a bad light i think you know but when you read room to dream and you kind of see the way lynch was with his wives mm -hmm. he was kind of i feel like his work put him in situations where he was not with his wife anymore and he was with the new people and then all of a sudden that new girl or whatever he would get feelings for he would it's uh, it sounds to me like He's got a big heart, and he would fall in love easily. Yeah, and that's true. I think he he loves the ladies, and he would fall in love with someone because he's not home with his wife anymore. He's out working, and I'm not saying that's an excuse. I'm just saying this is – when you read the book, you see that he's out for months, months yes. away from his family. So this allows his heart to wander Yes, because David Lynch – as a child was the same way so yeah. he was like he would just be like okay my what my my marriage is over i'm moving on and he would be with someone else like yeah. right out of the box he also really believed in this art life he really believed in that his his life really is in his art mm -hmm. and it's like i i i wish it's there's a part of me that wishes i could be that way i wish that i could make great work or stuff or do things and put my whole energy into that and Unfortunately, I mean, unfortunately, not unfortunate, but I also have other commitments. I have uh, commitments to my family and to my mm -hmm. work, uh, to other stuff that I have to do. Mm -hmm. But there is something beautiful in the way to think that you can put your all of your energy into one thing, into a film, into a painting, into something, and that, you know, that's I, what he wants. That's the life he really wants. Yeah, I think art is his first love, and I think he, he's someone who knows himself, and the people getting involved with him realize this and they're not going to change him so it's either well i guess we go our separate ways yeah. and all his exes and they all seem to be fine they still love him yeah isn't that isn't that amazing thing that you can still stay friends and you can still have the support rosalini came to the festival of disruption this past year so she still was supporting him and there's mm -hmm. still a friendship there and i think that's a wonderful thing. Yeah. I think that shows how charming David Lynch is that is and that he's seems like a good person that he can still stay friends with these people. Yeah, and he's not malicious in any no, way. I think no. it's just his art is first and then he falls in love with people as he's doing his art and Correct. then when that is done, he moves yeah. on. Yeah, you know, this whole idea the, the road less taken. I mean, the, the, I had a life where I thought, like, oh, maybe I'll go to Hollywood myself. It's like, I'll become a, <laughs> a, a film editor and, or a television editor, and I'll make films, and that'll be my life. And mm -hmm. that wasn't for me. I, I had other commitments. That, but it's still that idea of, like, the road less travel. And Lynch is living the life he wanted to live. Yeah. And, 
Uh, that's good for him. Yeah. So this was wonderful. I mean, this I, I'm so happy that we got to talk to Chris Rodley, a, a wonderful guy, a great storyteller, mm-hmm. and I wish he would write more books on Lynch. I wish he could, because there's still so much more to tell. I mean, I guess we're getting that in Room to Dream. But... I was about to say, I'm like, what else is there? Jeez, we got a <laughs> well, lot. At room the same to time, dream. you know, in Room to Dream, Lynch basically says that you know you could spend a whole just one day, a book on one day, or something like that. Like he feels like there's still so much more to tell in some ways. I almost feel like when he says that. That means, like, I got up, I had a cup of coffee, I went to the store. You know what I'm you saying? Don't think, you think it's mundane? Or? I think it's mundane stuff. Yeah. It probably. Because not everybody's life's interesting every single day. What? <laughs> David Lynch is. <laughs> I bet you there's a day where David Lynch just does nothing on a Sunday and he paints. Yes. And he could he could probably talk about that and make it sound interesting to us. But it's probably not the most fascinating thing. I don't know. He's a fascinating guy. Who am I kidding? Maybe he has a fascinating life. He's like James Bond. Uh, So this is good. This is kind of nice. This kind of goes in with what we've been doing lately. But uh, what do you think we're going to do next? What are our our future plans? You know, I think we're still talking about maybe taking time off here and there. We might take another uh, week off coming up soon. We might. We're debating on it. But, I mean. I think it's safe to say we have been generally every week, once in a great while, if you don't see our show on, during the week, it's not because our feed is broken. We just took the week off. Yeah. And I think going forward, you, you're going to see that a little bit more just because life is crazy for both of us. Right. And, and I think doing over over 150 shows straight, We deserve a little break now a, and yeah. again. Yeah. So maybe it'll be once once a month we take a, a, a week off or yeah. who knows. Yeah. But um, we, we do appreciate everyone who subscribes to us and s- subscribe to us on iTunes. You can... Leave us that five-star review. Leave us a nice little comment. We're also on Spotify. You can listen to us while you're playing your favorite video game on Xbox or PlayStation. Go at it. It's a lot of fun. We're on Google Play. We're also on Stitcher. And you can send us an email with a question, a comment, a theory at TwinPeaksUnwrap at gmail.com. You can follow us on the old Twitter, which we just did Twitter Live last week. Twitter is... It's still going well, right? Yeah, it's a yeah. great community, a wonderful community. I love all the pictures, seeing pictures from a, of just a few weeks ago from the Twin Peaks Festival, and just seeing, oh, yeah. or just people like hanging out. I mean, it's a. I was so jealous. Right, and I then what was it? it? Was it the week before that Kyle had his uh, wine tasting? Yes, right there, uh, basically at the Great Northern. I know, That's which I was uh, just like, okay, one week away, you got to just stay. Could he have just stayed another week? But he had his son's birthday. There you go. So yeah, he had his other commitments. Yeah, and man, I was very jealous of everybody. Who got to go to the festival? I was looking. Oh, I missed it. We just it. did it last year. I missed it. It's I been know. a whole year. All right. oh. Well, we got to actually be in the room with David Lynch. So yes, that, that was our year. I mean, that, that yeah, was it. Did, we, we were in. The, we were not only in the room with David Lynch at the festival of disruption, but we were also in the room with Kyle. I mm-hmm. mean, that is. <laughs> and you shook both their hands. I shook both their hands. So um, that yes. itself was that made the year. That made the year right there. But maybe next, maybe we'll try to do some other events. Maybe next year. Yeah, and I appreciate everybody who's still sticking out on Facebook. I know Facebook's going through some rough patches, but we're always getting new followers. Our page is blowing up. People are always leaving nice little comments, and they're liking things and uh, sharing things. I do appreciate that. I usually will man the old Facebook, so it's it's very nice to see. And with that being said, Ben, I think um, are we out of here? We're out of here. See you soon. I think that um, it's good to have some sort of boundaries, and I don't know exactly, you know, what it does, but um, it it uh, it helps. You you're forced to think that the boundaries getting too tight, like on a racer head, uh, the boundaries of no money stopped us cold. But um, too much money and too much freedom, sometimes you're just you know floating out in space, and it and it becomes uh, something other than uh, uh, filmmaking. And so I think that uh, maybe when I said that, maybe somebody like Dino could have, uh, you know, just, just made a tighter uh, corral around the whole process and, and it could have um, sparked something and something better could have happened. I don't know. But I like a boundary, some sort of restriction. Uh, it's just, um, it almost you know, f- uh, pushes, it pushes me. Um, but I also, for artistic uh, business, I like freedom there. And uh, so I think the two things can coexist. You need a a real good uh, producer who is totally organized, but who also keeps you from getting uh, a little bit too crazy.